studio, Dr. Jane Goodall. And right now, it's about that time we have a catch up with her and see what she says. Our special guest today is an extraordinary individual. She's well known across the world as a conservationist as well as her groundbreaking contribution to primatology. And we're most privileged to have her in our studio, especially on the year of her 80th birthday, which will be on the 3rd of April this year. Dr. Jane Goodall, welcome to Express and welcome to South Africa. It's great to have you here. Well, thanks. It's great to be here. Now, tell me about your, your love for, for animals and how it all started because essentially that's what's made your life, what has built your life and to where you are right now. Well, it started when I was a tiny little girl. I don't know where it came from. It was always animals, animals, animals. Having a mother who supported this passion didn't get mad at me when I really scared the whole family. We'd gone to stay on a farm in the country, which was exciting because we lived in London. And I was given the job of collecting hen's eggs. And, you know, I kept asking, but where does the egg come out of a hen? Because I couldn't see a hole like that. <laughs> so I disappeared one day for five hours, and I was waiting. Age, age four, imagine, waiting for four to five hours in a hen house. Wow. But I saw the egg being laid. Good. <laughs> and my mother didn't get mad at me. And if she had, she might have crushed that whole uh, spirit of wanting to learn, discover, and the thrill of discovery. You just spoke about your spirit for discovering and I mean we know your work is groundbreaking and you've had an amazing story and I would imagine an amazing life. How do you start out as a young girl in the 60s saying I want to go and find chimpanzees and know more? How do you become the greatest researcher ever? Well I didn't, it didn't start that way at all. It started when I was 10 and I found a book called Tarzan of the Apes mm -hmm. and fell in love with Tarzan. What did he do? He married the wrong Jane. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I so totally do. That's when I decided I'm going to go up, grow up, go to Africa, live with animals and write books about them. Mm. Everybody laughed. World War II raging. We didn't have any money. Um, couldn't even afford uh, new books. Uh, I was a girl. Girls didn't do that sort of thing. Yes. Jane, dream about something you can achieve. Not my mother. Jane, if you really want something, you have to work hard. You must take advantage of opportunity and never give up. That's what she said. So I was invited to Africa by a, a school friend, saved up the money working as a waitress. Mm -hmm. And then when I was out in Kenya, heard about the late Louis Leakey, spent his life searching for the fossils of early man. And he wanted somebody to go and study chimpanzees because they're our closest living relative. Mm -hmm. I would have studied any animal. It was just to be out in the bush in the wild. Mm -hmm. And what do I get? The one most like us. Amazing. Indeed, indeed. Take me through that first experience, because I remember last year going to uh, Congo Brazzaville and awaiting that opportunity to perhaps see a gorilla in its natural habitat. What was it like for you to be with those animals, knowing that you are completely at their mercy, essentially? Well, initially it was unbelievably frustrating because they're very conservative. They'd never seen a white ape before. <laughs> <laughs> so they would take one look and vanish into the vegetation. Uh. I was learning from sitting up on a high peak with my binoculars. I actually was learning more than I thought. Wow. But the breakthrough was with this chimpanzee who began to lose his fear before the others. I called him David Greybeard. Wow. And on this never-to-be-forgotten day, I was going through the vegetation. I saw a termite mound and crouched over it was a black shape and I saw a hand reach out and pick a piece of grass and push it down, pull it out and eat the termites. I saw him pick a leafy twig and strip off the leaves to make a tool. And that was exciting then because it was thought then that humans and only humans used and made tools. I'd like to know this. Um, you once said that animals have become a lot far more successful than us at uh, living in their natural environment because they've been living there for thousands and thousands of years, yet they've never overpopulated, they've never destroyed it. We as humans, as clever as we are, we have managed to create a few destructive mm. elements in, 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 our, in our existence. What is it that you think you've learned personally, other than all the, the scientific research that you take from all of your experience with chimpanzees? Well, there's two things. One is that chimps make it very clear that we're not the only beings with personalities minds capable of thought and above all emotions, happiness, sadness, fear, despair, all things that I was told when I finally got to university to do a PhD, the professors told me I'd done everything wrong. But you see, when I was growing up, I had this wonderful teacher who taught me absolutely the professors are wrong. And that was my dog, Rusty. <laughs> you can't share your life in a meaningful way with any kind of animal and not know 
that they have personalities and minds and feelings. We know they do. How is it then that the being, which is obviously the most intellectual that's ever walked on this planet, is destroying its only home? And destroying it so fast. That's why I'm traveling 300 days a year. That's why I hope that, you know, because everybody apart from me thinks it's wonderful to be 80. I don't think it's wonderful at all. I've got far too much left to do to be 80. <laughs> if we don't realize that all these natural resources are going to end, they're finite, yeah. then what about our great-great-grandchildren? Wow. How unfair is it? And indeed, that's part of the reason why you're here. You had a talk last week with students at UCT, uh, The Life and Times of Dr. Jane Goodall. And I mean, I think that through that, you're hoping to inspire young people to start thinking differently about the future. So for those that weren't there, what would you say to them? How do you begin to make a change? How do you begin to change the world for a better, for future generations? If we start realizing that, you know, every single one of us makes a difference every day, you have to make an impact. And we can choose what sort of impact. Mm -hmm. What are the consequences of what I buy, what I wear, what I eat? Where did it come from? Did it involve cruelty to animals or people? If you start thinking like that, mm -hmm. you know, people then begin to change the way they behave. So our Roots and Shoots program yes. for young people, um, which is growing quite fast in South Africa, mm -hmm. began in Tanzania with 12 high school students. Yes. It's now in 134 countries. Great. It has about 150,000 active groups and members from kindergarten all the way through university and even adult groups now. And every group, knowing that they make, every individual makes a difference mm -hmm. every day, and every group choosing projects to make the world better, to help people, to help animals, to help the environment that we all share with a theme of let's learn to live in peace and harmony with ourselves, you know, between cultures, between religions, between black and white, between old and young, between rich and poor, but also between us and the natural world. And yes, some people are brilliant at making money and that's perfect if they use it for good causes like giving money to the Jane Goodall Institute for my birthday. There, you <laughs> there we go, that's what that's we need to idea. do. That's yeah. what we need to do. But I think we, we can't go without asking about your travel companion over there. That's Tell us a bit about you. Wait yes. a minute, that's not a chimpanzee, right? He was ah. given to me as a chimpanzee by a man who went blind when he was 21 in the US Marines. Mm. Uh, Gary Horn, so this is Mr. H for Horn. He, you know, he's a very inspirational person. So he thought he was giving me a chip. <laughs> and I made him I made him hold the tail. So I said, Gary, feel. you have no, no excuse. <laughs> he said, never mind, take him with you and you know I'm with you in spirit. So he's been with me now to 59 countries. Wow. And so he's quite be, a traveler. Yeah, he's a real traveler. One more question. Yes, I yes. have one. There's, there's this legendary picture of you um, uh, engaging with a chimpanzee, almost kissing. How many chimps have you kissed? <laughs> Well, only captive chimps. Uh, I don't go around kissing chimpanzees, actually, because we really have a hands-off policy. That little chimp was a, an orphan, a very sad little fellow in the Prague Zoo, and his mother had rejected him. And so, you know, because, you see, they kiss, they embrace, they hold hands, they pat one another on the back, just like we do. So that they kiss, we kiss, so when you want to comfort a little orphan like that, you use the gestures that they know. Dr. Gurul, thank you so, so much. You are an amazing individual, as I said in the beginning, and thank you for the inspiration that you have brought to our country. And I know that many young people watching this right now will be extremely motivated and inspired to know wow. that. I mean, if this can be done in, in, in one lifetime, there's so much, so much that can be done, uh, you know, looking forward, never giving up and really pushing for, for, for good things and, you know, for the good of humanity, for the good of life on Earth. Well, thank you so much for bringing peace and for bringing amazing, amazing stuff and some good news to our Feel Good Breakfast show. This is Expresso on SABC3.